So hi everyone, my name is Tian Yuli and I'm a PhD candidate in the University of Freiburg in Germany. And I'm really excited to have all of you joining us today. I want to start by introducing you our wonderful speaker, Dr. Arian Nunes Alves. So Arian finished her PhD at the University of Sao Paulo, Brazil. And uh, then she moved to Germany for a postdoc in the Heidelberg Institute for Theoretical Studies. In 2019, she got the Alexander von Humboldt Fellowship and was hosted by the Heidelberg Institute for Theoretical Studies. Last year, she became a junior group leader in the Technical University of Berlin. And the aim of her lab is to understand how drugs and small molecules bind to their molecular partners in vitro and inside cells. And today she is going to talk about protein ligand binding kinetics in drug discovery. If you have questions to our speaker or if you run into technical issues, please send a message in using the chat box. Please note that I'm recording the event and will share the recording on my BDBD channel for others who could not join us today so they may benefit from the content. Throughout today's event, you can send your question as I said in the chat. We will address them in the Q&A session so feel free to add anything you have that you would like to share with our speaker. Uh, now I welcome Aria. So now the time is yours. Okay, so hi everyone. Uh, thank you so much, Jen Yu, for this invitation. I'm super happy to be here with you today to talk about one of my favorite topics, uh, which is uh, ligand binding kinetics. You can see my slides and you can hear me fine, right? But if you don't, just tell me. Ah. So, okay, uh, getting started. So today uh, I'm going to start with an introduction about kinetics of protein ligand binding in drug design. And then we'll move on to the methods, molecular dynamic simulations uh, and tau random accelerated molecular dynamics to enhance sampling. And then uh, we'll talk about some of the, res the results of my postdoc time uh, in Heidelberg. So prediction of ligand binding kinetics for T4 lysozyme mutants and prediction of ligand binding kinetics also for kinases. So getting started with the introduction, uh, kinetics of protein ligand binding in drug design. So uh, protein ligand binding, uh, as you can see in this picture, is a very special phenomenon because uh, this is how cells uh, sense the environment. So here we have a cell with the plasma membrane in orange, and then in the plasma membrane, we have receptors. And then we have a stimuli, these yellow circles that could be, for instance, uh, ligands, small molecules that bind to the receptors and they start a whole uh, signaling pathway inside the cells that can culminate with a lot of different things like fertilization, cell prolifer proliferation, cell differentiation, or cell death. So major point here, protein ligand binding uh, is very special because this is how cells sense the environment. And protein ligand binding is also, also special in drug design uh, because this is how we can uh, fight uh, specific diseases. We can uh, design ligands that will either inhibit or activate a specific target protein. And then here uh, we have a very brief overview of uh, the drug discovery and development timeline. So initially, uh, we have to decide about our target or uh, which protein we are going to target uh, to fight a specific disease, for instance, cancer or COVID, uh, you name it. And then after we have a specific protein target, we have uh, the phase of lead identification and lead optimization, which is, uh, and this is highlighted here because this is related to our seminar today. So lead is a small molecule that will bind to our target protein and have the desired effect. And lead identification, uh, first we'll identify uh, one or a few molecules uh, that bind to our target protein, and then we'll optimize the small molecules so they have uh, uh, even higher affinity, for instance, for the specific protein target. And afterwards, we move on uh, for this adimet tox, which means uh, analyze the properties of absorption in, absorption in the body, uh, distribution and toxicity. And then we go to the clinical developments or clinical trials where we test the drug, the drugs or candidate drugs in human beings, and finally goes to approval by agencies. So uh, one of the key things here in lead identification and lead optimization 
is to decide uh, the quantitative metrics of what is a good binder. So what is a good ligand uh, for our target protein? And for this, uh, we can talk about uh, thermodynamics and kinetics of protein ligand binding to make the decision of uh, what is a good or a bad binder. And now uh, starting with thermodynamics. So traditionally uh, in the past years and for a long, long time, uh, what, we, what people usually do in the pharmaceutical industry is to look at the thermodynamic properties of protein ligand binding to decide what is a good binder. So uh, here we have a very simple scheme, the protein in orange, uh, the ligand is this red square, and here we have the protein ligand complex or the bound state. When we have equilibrium conditions, or in other words, when the concentration of protein ligand and the protein ligand complex is constant, and when the flux uh, to form or, the, or to dissociate the bound state is the same, in these very special conditions, we can talk about uh, Kg, the dissociation constant, or delta Gb, the binding free energy. And these are measures uh, for the affinity of the ligand for the protein. So Kg, for instance, is given by the concentration of uh, the protein and the ligands divided by the concentration of the protein ligand complex in equilibrium. And delta Gb can be given by this equation here, where R is the gas constant and T is the temperature uh, in Kelvin and Kg is the same Kg here. And last point I want to make about uh, thermodynamics and uh, thermodynamic measurements is that Kg and delta Gb are state functions. Or in other words, they only depend on the, on the end states of the binding process. And the end states in this case are the unbound state and the bound state. So it's enough to know the bounds and the unbound states to characterize thermodynamics. But uh, recently, People in the drug design industry uh, also started looking at the kinetics of protein ligand binding. And kinetics is special because it applies not only for equilibrium conditions, but also for steady state conditions. In steady state conditions, we have again, constant concentration of protein ligand and the protein ligand complex. But now in steady state conditions, we don't have uh, anymore the same probability flux for the formation or the dissociation of the bound state. So in this very special case, uh, we can talk about K on and K off. So K on is the association rate constant or the rate of complex formation, while K off here is the rate of complex dissociation or the dissociation rate constant. And something very common nowadays is not to refer to K off, but instead talk about uh, tau, the residence time, which is just the inverse of K off. And the residence time means uh, the time the drug spends bound to the target protein. And K on and K off are very special because they are better descriptors for non equilibrium systems. And a very special class of non equilibrium systems are us and our cells. So our cells are constantly dragging glucose and O2 from the environment and converting it to CO2 and energy. And last remark I want to do about K on and K off and that uh, different from Kg that we saw in the last slide, they are not state functions. In other words, they depend on the path we use to move from one state to another. So if you want to know K on, we really have to do a good characterization of the pathways uh, the ligand takes to go from the unbound state to the bound state. And as I told you before, uh, kinetic rates uh, are attracting attention in drug design, and it, I would say it's an emerging topic in drug design. And the reason for this uh, is that kinetic rates can be better correlated with in vivo efficacy. Just thinking about longer tau, if we have a longer tau, a longer residence time, uh, this means that the drug spends more time bound to the target protein, then we have a longer physiological effect and we also have less off-target binding. And the drug uh, protein residence time uh, idea was first proposed in 2006 in this paper here at Nature Reveals uh, Drug Discovery. And another fact that highlights the importance of uh, binding kinetics in drug design is this consortium here, the Kinetics for Drug Discovery Pro Project, or K4DD, which was a collaboration between uh, pharmaceutical industries and universities here in Europe. And we'll talk a little bit about it uh, later in this presentation. 
And finally, just to give you an example, uh, here uh, the authors uh, in this paper from 2012, they were looking at inhibitors of the adenosine H-ray receptor, and they were interested in measure, measuring the efficacy in site cells. So here in this axis here, or in this axis here, we have the efficacy in site cells compared to a known drug. And here we have the logarithm of the inhibition constant, which is a thermodynamic equilibrium measurement. And here we have the logarithm of the residence time, which is a no equilibrium measurement uh, and describe, describes kinetics. So if you look at the coefficients of determination, uh, here with the, we have an R square or coefficients of determination of 0 0.13 and here is 0 0.990 meaning that uh, for the residence time, we have a much uh, stronger correlation uh, with the efficacy. And this uh, is also exemplified for other uh, targets as well in the literature. Now going a bit more into detail into this K40D project. So this K40D project uh, was funded by this Innovative Medicines Initiative which is jointly funded by the European Union and the European pharmaceutical industry with the aim of developing the next generation treatments, medicines, and vaccines. And the K4DD project, if you want to know more about it, you can check this review. And it ran from 2012 until 2017. And the aims, uh, the major goal was to really improve uh, binding kinetics uh, and the methods for this, especially the experimental and the computational methods. So what people wanted to do uh, is to improve the understanding of drug target binding kinetics from the test tube to the human body and uh, make uh, this analysis of kinetics and drug design a routine uh, in pharmaceutical companies. And just to give you an examples, some examples of the nice things that this project achieved. Uh, one of the things that I think was very nice is that uh, the k 4 d project developed new experimental approaches to characterize uh, K on and K off rates for uh, G protein coupled receptors or GPCRs represented here. For instance, one of the things was to develop uh, different immobilization procedures for surface plasma resonance or SPR. So SPR is represented here. It's a very uh, common method to estimate kinetic rates experimentally. And what you have to do is to immobilize the receptor in a surface and then you, row, you run um, a solution with the ligands uh, you want to use to measure kinetic rates. And then uh, based on the diffraction of the light, uh, you can estimate uh, the kinetic rates here for this specific ligand. And this was a challenge for the PCRs because of course the GPCRs have to be in the main brain to be immobilized here. And another nice thing that was done was the development of fluorescent ligands, not only for the PCRs, but also for other proteins for bioluminescence, resonance, energy transfer, or breadth which is also another technique to measure kinetic rates. And the nice thing about this technique is that you can measure kinetic rates inside living cells. You don't have to disrupt then and remove the protein for experiments. And of course, from the experimental perspective, this k 4 d project generated a lot of kinetic data, especially for kinases and GPCRs. And all this kinetic data uh, is published and available in Kenbo, which is a repository for a lot of uh, biological data, not only for kinetic rates. And the availability of this good experimental, da experimental data allowed the development of a lot of computational and, uh, methods to predict kinetic rates. And um, because uh, we had this lots of uh, data, uh, from experiments, we were able to develop a lot of computational methods to predict kinetic rates. And also another thing uh, that attracted a lot of computational people to uh, kinetic data uh, and development of computational methods was, of course, the interest of the pharmaceutical industry. So nowadays, we can broadly speak about two classes of methods to predict kinetic rates for ligand binding, one of them are physics-based methods and the other uh, the, of them are knowledge-based methods. So I recently reviewed uh, some of these methods in this review from 2020, you can check it out. And there's also a nice toolbox, a KB box developed by my former boss, Professor Rebecca Wade, 
uh, which contains a lot of uh, papers about kinetics and also tutorials if you want to learn methods there. So talking about physics-based methods, they consist of molecular dynamic simulations combined with some enhanced sampling technique that will increase our chances that we will see binding and unbinding events in the simulations. And the nice thing about them is that they do not require experimental data to be trained. And the downside is that the predictions may take days or weeks to happen. Now, knowledge-based methods, they are also referred in the literature as machine learning methods, especially uh, regression methods. And the downside here is that we usually require experimental, we require experimental data for training. We usually require a lot of this data, like tens or hundreds of data points to make a good, to train uh, the model and have a good model in the end, Boom, a model with a good predictive power. Uh, but the advantage here is that once we train the model, we can make predictions for other new ligands in uh, or candidate drugs in a matter of seconds or minutes. And this was the introduction. I hope I convinced you that uh, kinetics is an emerging topic in drug design in the pharmaceutical industry. And now we are going to briefly talk about the methods. Well, I'm assuming uh, you are familiar with molecular dynamic simulation, so I'll not talk a lot about it here, but this is uh, the basis of all the results I'm going to present to you today here. So uh, from the chemical perspective, uh, the molecular world would be better represented by the Schrodinger equation than by the looking at the motion of electrons, but unfortunately, proteins are super big molecules and it's not feasible to do quantum mechanical calculations for molecules of the size of a protein. So to make things feasible here, uh, what we usually do is to use as an approximation to propagate the motion of atoms, uh, use the Newton uh, equation of motion. So here we have it. Uh, we have the acceleration over, over atom I, and this is calculated by looking at the forces over the atom and the mass of the atom. So uh, knowing the acceleration, we can uh, know uh, what will be the position of the atom in the next time step and also its velocity. And one thing here, of course, is that we need to know the forces acting over the atom. And to describe the forces, we look at the interaction energies over uh, oh, this atom. And they, for this, we usually need a force field that would describe these interactions. And the interactions, they are bonded interactions and non-bonded interactions. The bonded interactions are described by uh, bonds, uh, which are uh, usually described by a harmonic potential angles also described by a harmonic potential and torsions described by this equation here. And we also have non-bonded interactions uh, described by uh, Van der Waals uh, interactions, which are given by this Leonard Jones potential here and electrostatics interactions uh, that represent attraction or repulsion between charges. And okay, molecular dynamic simulations, but still uh, molecular dynamic simulations usually reach the time scale of nanoseconds or microseconds, depending on your hardware and depending also on the size of your system. But this is too a challenge to study kinetics because what happens is that while molecular dynamic simulations reach the microsecond time scale at best, uh, the binding and unbinding events usually take uh, milliseconds or more to happen experimentally. So we somehow have to bridge these uh, conflicting timescales. So what is common in the literature is use something that we call enhanced sampling methods. And the role of enhanced sampling methods uh, combined with molecular dynamic simulations is to increase the chances that we will see uh, the events we want to see, which in this case, in this presentation, are unbinding events or the ligands dissociating from the protein. Um, for this specific presentation, we are going to extens extensively talk about tau Renge. So tau Renge uh, means tau random acceleration molecular dynamics. And the idea here uh, is that in this method, we will facilitate dissociation of the ligand by applying a force of constant magnitude and random orientation in the center of mass of the ligand. So for uh, people who like uh, to know uh, more details about the codes, uh, Tau Renji was initially developed for NEMG uh, here in this publication of 2018. Uh, and it was more recently uh, also uh, developed 
developed by Gromax. So if you want to see the last version, uh, the Gromax version uh, from 2020, it's from this paper. And this uh, town range was developed by my previous lab mate, Daria Koch, uh, under the supervision of my former boss, Professor Rebecca Wade at the Heidelberg Institute for Theoretical Studies. Now, uh, let's go a little bit in detail into this method. So the idea here is that we have a group of ligands and because we are applying uh, this force, we no longer know the absolute K of uh, values or tau values, but we have relative tau values. And therefore, uh, we can decide uh, which ligands have longer and which ligands have shorter residence time. And in the pharmaceutical industry, what we usually want is ligands with longer residence time that will spend more time bound to the target having a longer physiological effect. So, okay, first of all, uh, we need a model of the protein ligand complex. This can be obtained by docking or from crystal structures. And then we equilibrate the system uh, in a conventional molecular dynamic simulation. And afterwards, we start at time, at time zero, we start applying a force of random orientation. And then after time delta t, we check the displacement of the ligand. If this, this displacement is larger than a threshold, then uh, we keep the random orientation of the force. But if the displacement is smaller than a threshold, then we change the orientation of the force, as you can see here. And then in one simulation, we keep doing these steps of propagating the motion of the system and then checking the displacement of the ligand until in the end, uh, the ligand achieves the unbound or dissociated state. And here, uh, just to give you an overview of why using tau -Rangi. So here we have experimental residence times uh, in this axis. And here we have the simulation time required per compound to make uh, predictions about absolute or relative kinetic rates. So what we can see here is that uh, there are methods like weighted ensemble Markov states modeling that have a very high computational cost. And on the other hand, we have other methods like uh, tau Renji and the targeted molecular dynamics, which can provide you uh, relative uh, residence times in a much... Uh, with much lower computational cost, uh, computational cost in the uh, scale of nanoseconds. And that's the big advantage of uh, tau range. It gives you uh, relative uh, tau values with uh, not so much computational effort required. Okay, now I hope you're experts in tau range. We're going to move to the results now. So uh, prediction of ligand binding kinetics for T4 lysozyme mutants. So starting with T4 lysozyme, so in its white type form, uh, T4 lysozyme cleaves bacteria cell wall. But here uh, we are not concerned with the white type form, but with the mutants, especially with the mutant in position 99. So uh, this mutation in position 99 is a mutation for leucine to alanine highlighted here in yellow, and it creates a hydrophobic cavity that can bind to benzene and other small molecules like indole. And this is a, these mutants are very special because uh, they are a popular model system in the literature to study thermodynamics and kinetics of protein ligand binding. And the reason it's a popular model system uh, from the computational and experimental perspective is that this engineered uh, binding site is very simple. It's hidden from solvent and it shows only small automatic changes when ligand complexation happens. But uh, this binding site is simple, but it's also has challenges. For instance, uh, you can see here that the ligand is really buried in this binding site hidden from solvent, and then it's not, there is no obvious pathway for the ligand to come in or out of this buried binding site. And a lot of people are uh, starting looking at uh, T4 lysozyme to either characterize pathways, as you can see here, or to compute uh, K off rates, as you can see here. So looking at the K of rates, people used a lot of methods uh, like uh, machine learning methods here in this line, uh, metadynamics, as you can see here, here and here, different flavors of metadynamics, weighted ensemble, which, which was the work of my uh, PhD uh, with Professor Guilherme Arentes and Professor Daniel Zuckerman on microbe state modeling. And as you can see here, different methods, they have uh, different uh, error factors and they also require different computational time per compound. 
And sometimes uh, methods can take like a few microseconds or tens of microseconds to make predictions, which is a lot of time. And uh, what I want to highlight to you today here is the, are the pathways. So uh, nine different studies in the literature try to characterize pathways for benzene unbinding. And the pathways found in the literature across these nine studies are all represented here. So here in orange, again, we have benzene. And each arrow represents a different pathway. And the pathways are named after the helices benzene approaches. For instance, path FGH uh, in this pathway, benzene approached uh, helices F, J, and H to leave the binding site. So what we saw uh, looking at the whole literature is that uh, all these nine studies using different computational methods had different results, which is quite uh, surprising because the results should be similar. And the only single thing these nine different studies had in common uh, was this pathway in blue, path FGH. And then five studies found the pathways in green here, four studies found the pathways here in cyan, and one study found these pathways in pink. So uh, we were very curious uh, about this strange result that different computational methods have different, uh, find different pathways. And then uh, what we wanted to do here was to characterize the populations of the pathways for ligand exits and see if these populations could explain these apparently uh, different results uh, across different computational methods. So first thing we did, uh, of course, was to characterize uh, residence times for T4 lysozyme. And then uh, the mutant I showed you before uh, was mutant 99. And then we characterized kinetic rates for a lot of mutants, uh, for all uh, mutants and complexes that had uh, experimental results available in the literature. So you can see here, uh, we used in our tau ranger simulations, uh, this complex, which is benzene bound to mutant 99, but also benzene bound to mutant 102, this mutation here in cyan, benzene bound to mutant 104, and finally indole, another ligand bound to mutant 99. And here uh, we used, uh, to characterize kinetic rates, we obtained uh, about uh, 120 independent uh, dissociation events for each of these complexes. And we used a very low force of around a four kilocal per mole per angstrom, and you can see here uh, the comparison between uh, experimental residence times and computed residence times using tau Renji. We obtained uh, coefficients, coefficients of determination R square of 0 0.78, meaning that tau Renji can accurately predict relative residence times for this model system. And something I forgot to say is that if you want to read more about the results here, you can check the paper from last year at Current Research in Structural Biology. And okay, we saw that the simulations reproduced experiments. Then we moved on to do intense data analysis to see what we could learn from the simple model system about the factors regulating uh, residence times. First thing we did uh, was to do uh, interaction fingerprint analysis and look at the last two or three snapshots of each molecular dynamic simulations to characterize unbinding pathways. And we did hierarchical clustering uh, to automate our identification of unbinding pathways. So here, for instance, we see the unbinding pathways for benzene uh, dissociating from the mutant 99. So here, for instance, we, we have in pink uh, pathway FGH, and here in green path HJ, and in cyan path DJ, uh, DG, sorry. And here we have the populations of different pathways for different mutants. So here, for instance, we have benzene bound to mutant 99. And as we can see here for different temperatures, the most populated pathway is pathway FGH, this pathway here in pink. And we can see that it has a relative population, which is quite high of around 70%. And then the second most populated pathway, HJ, and other pathways with lower population. And also for other mutants, uh, for benzene bound to mutant 102 or indole bound to mutant 99, again, the most po populated pathway is the same pathway FGH. So the whole conclusion of this slide is that path FGH, uh, this one, is the most probable path for ligand unbinding in this model system. 
And this is very interesting because this explained the previous results we saw in the literature. So previously I told you that there were nine different computational studies. They found different pathways and the only thing they had in common was pathway FGH. And this was probably the case because path FGH is the most probable pathway for ligand unbinding in this system. And now uh, we also looked at the intermediate states for ligand unbinding. So again, we did interaction fingerprint analysis, this time looking at the snapshots for, from the last two nanoseconds of simulations. And we clustered all the ligand protein complexes using k-means. And here uh, you have the results of the different metastable states we found here for benzene bound to mutant 99, which has a long residence time. And here for benzene bound to mutant 102 with a short residence time. And now bear with me because there is a lot of information on this slide. So uh, each circle here represents a different cluster. Uh, the size of the circle is proportional to the side of to the size of the population of the cluster. And in this axis, we have the root mean square deviation between the ligand in the crystal structure and the ligand uh, in the centroid of the cluster. And uh, each number here is just to depict a different cluster. And the color also represents the RMSG or the root mean square deviation. The darker the color, the highest the RMSG from the ligand in the crystal structure. And finally, uh, we have orange and gray lines. The orange lines represent the number of transition events between one cluster and the other. And the gray lines represents the transition uh, probability flux between one cluster and the other. And the thicker the line, the higher the flux. So uh, looking at this picture, uh, we have low RMSG values for clusters one to four, meaning these clusters one to four represent the bound state. Then we have intermediate states five, six, and seven. And finally, we have cluster eight, which represents the unbound state. Now looking at the main pathway for dissociation or following the thick uh, gray arrows, we have uh, the main pathway of dissociation going from cluster four to cluster five to cluster six to cluster eight. So in other words, for the main pathway, you have two intermediate states here. And now uh, looking at the results for this other complex and following, following again the main pathway for dissociation, we have dissociation from cluster two to cluster five to cluster eight. So here we just have one intermediate state, which is cluster five. And then uh, what we see here is that for this uh, complex, which has longer residence time, we also see um, a higher number of intermediate states. So the main conclusion of this whole slide is that when we visit multiple intermediate states, the residence time is longer. And that's it. This is what I wanted to present to you about C4 lysozyme. And now moving to the final part of this presentation, prediction, prediction of ligand binding kinetics for kinases. Now some pharmaceutical interest here. And the kinases we'll talk about in this presentation are FAK and PYK2. So we have FAK represented here with a ligand in green. FAK stands for focal adhesion kinase, and PYK2 stands for proline rich tyrosine kinase 2, which has 61% sequence identity with FAK. And these two kinases are involved in cell migration and survival, and they have pharmaceutical interest because they are involved, they are involved in cancer, more specifically in tumor proliferation and metastasis. So previous results in the literature uh, were available for kinetic rates uh, for a couple of ligands. And for this couple of ligands, uh, it was known that uh, there was kinetic selectivity. In other words, these ligands had a very high residence time for FAK, but not for PYK2. So uh, we got curious about these results and we decided to investigate it further, uh, both from the experimental and from the computational perspective. So uh, the main goal of this part of the work was to obtain mechanistic insights about the kinetic selectivity between FAK and PYK2, or in other words, why are there ligands which have long residence time for FAK only? And if you want to know more about this work or read about it, you can check the paper from last year at Cell Chemical Biology. Okay, uh, now first thing we did, uh, we had experimental partners at Merck and also uh, Professor Stefan Knapp from the Goethe University in Frankfurt. And the experimental partners, uh, they characterize kinetic rates uh, 
for 12 ligands, uh, 12 inhibitors binding to FAK and PYK2. And here in this axis, we have the experimental kinetic rates. And from the computational side, uh, we use tau render to predict relative kinetic rates, uh, as you can see in this axis. And again, we had around uh, something around 80 to 100 independent and binding events uh, for each complex. And this time uh, we used a dissociation force of around uh, 13 kilocal per mole per angstrom. And as you can see here, we got a coefficient of determination of 0 0.91, meaning that Tarwanji can accurately predict relative residence times for FAK and PYK2. And now, uh, just to show you what I mean by kinetic selectivity, if we look at ligands 10 and 1, for instance, we can see that they have very long residence times uh, for FAK, which is represented in red, but they have a short residence times for PYK2 in green. You see a ligand 1 is here and ligand, 11, and ligand 10 sorry, is here. So this is what I mean by kinetic selectivity. So some ligands have long residence times only for FAK as we can see here in this part of the graph. So, okay, we saw that simulations reproduce experiments. Again, we've moved on to do analysis, but this time we analyzed uh, only uh, the equilibration uh, of the ligand protein complexes before applying the Tarrand method to take the ligand off. So here in this first part, uh, we have uh, the interactions between each of the 12 inhibitors and FAK. Here again, each of the 12 inhibitors and PYK2. In this side, we have the hydrogen bonds. I'll not talk about them today. What I want to highlight to you today are the hydrophobic interactions, the underestimated hydrophobic interactions. Here, hydrophobic interactions between FAK, FAK and the inhibitors and between PYK and the inhibitors. And here, uh, the darker the color, uh, the more common uh, is the interaction found uh, in the group of snapshots uh, for the ligand co protein complex we analyzed. So when we have a white square, for instance, we don't, we don't find interactions at all, but when we have the blue square, this means that the interactions are very, very frequent, close to, uh, close to be found in 100% of the snapshots. And here we can see that for some ligands, uh, we have interactions between this leucine 567 and the inhibitors, but we don't ever see this interaction between the equivalent leucine, leucine 570, and the inhibitors in PYK2. And now looking at the residence times again, uh, we have the residence times here. Ligands 1, 10, and 11, for instance, have longer residence times. And these ligands with longer residence times are also the ligands that have this interaction with leucine 567. So the main conclusion of this slide here is that uh, what, what we can see, which is a stark difference uh, between ligands with long and short residence time, is that ligands with longer residence times make interactions with leucine 567. And then we've moved on and we looked at this interaction in the crystal structures. So here we have FAK bound to ligand one, uh, which has a very long residence time or a low K off value. And here we have ligand one again in yellow bound to PYK2, which is uh, in this case is a complex with a short residence time or a high K off value. And what we can see here, uh, if you look at leucine 567, is that uh, leucine 567 is, is making this very close contact to the inhibitor, and mostly because we have this helical DFG. And DFG is a special motive uh, for kinases because it's very important for, it, for their function. And here, looking at this DFG again, we don't have this heli helix motive in PYK2, and the equivalent leucine, which is leucine 570, is not even represented here, meaning that the leucine is far away from the ligand. It's not interacting with this. So main uh, message here is that uh, helical DFG motif seen here leads to stronger interactions with leucine 567, which in turn leads to longer residence times. Main conclusions here, uh, I hope, I hope to uh, convince you that binding kinetics is an emerging topic in drug design and is attracting a lot of attention because uh, in vivo, uh, 
in, in vivo uh, results, uh, in vivo efficacy for drugs is better correlated with uh, no equilibrium properties like kinetic rates instead of equilibrium properties. And what we, we, I hope I showed you today uh, that computational methods can be used not only to predict kinetic rates, but also to provide mechanistic insights about the factors modulating uh, such kinetic rates. For instance, uh, even for a very simple model system like T4 lysozyme, we learned that when we have more metastable states, we have longer residence times. And for the kinases, we learned that this hydrophobic interaction that happened because of this helical DFG motive led to longer residence times and kinetic selectivity. And that's it. Uh, I want to thank... Uh, so this work was done during my postdoc time at the Heidelberg Institute for Theoretical Studies. So I have huge thanks to give to Professor Rebecca Wade, my former uh, advisor, and Daria Koch, which was a great collaborator uh, and partner in my previous lab. And also uh, the kinases work was done in a collaboration with Professor Stefan Knapp from the Goethe University of Frankfurt and also in a collaboration with Merck. And also thank to my sponsors during my postdoc time. I was initially sponsored by the Cluster of Excellence Cell Networks and afterwards by a CAPES Humboldt Fellowship joint, jointly sponsored by CAPES in Brazil and the Humboldt Foundation in Germany. And the last thing I want to say is that right now I am a junior group leader at the Technical University of Berlin and I have a lot of positions open. And right now I have two open positions for PhD students. So if you want to know more about those positions, you feel free to either email me or check this website. And that's it. Thank you for your attention in this beautiful Sunday. Yay. All right. <laughs> Thank you, Arian, for the very informative talk. And uh, maybe you can also put the link in our chat box so people can directly uh, go to the website and check the PhD position. Okay, I'll try to do it. Wait, wait, Thank wait. you. Okay, great. Oh, so it's broken. Oh, oh weird. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> in the chat. Thanks. Okay, so for all people who want to find a PhD position in this direction, please go to the link and check the uh, description there. And if you want to apply, just uh, yeah, drop an email. Yeah, okay. And there are some people thanking you for the nice talk. And we have one question and I try to <laughs> translate from Chinese to English. So um, the question is, uh, the back pocket of type two kinase inhibitors uh, can accommodate some lipophilic, oh no, sorry, hydrophobic uh, fragments like uh, hydroxy group or amino group. Ooh, oh my God. I'm not sure. I'm not sure either. I, yeah, I didn't even comment about the type of inhibitors here. I think these inhibitors were type two, but I can't be wrong on this. I really don't remember specifically the type. And then, yeah, I don't know. I would really need to check out because I don't have the whole picture in my head right now. Sorry, you yeah. can email me later and then I can check out on this. Yeah, okay, thanks. Um, and now there are uh, a lot of people thanking you for your time and for sharing all the great insights. and. Uh, so, so far, there is no further question in the chat, and I personally have some questions. <laughs> yeah. And, um, so, um, I want to ask in general, uh, like what kind of characteristics of ligands contribute to a longer residence time? I'm not sure if it's uh, also researched, and um, I mean, if it's like if we know in general some characteristic of the ligands contribute to longer residence time, then maybe people can do a targeted optimization to increase, for example, the number of intermediates or the longer residence time. Well, that's a wonderful question. Yeah. Uh, so one of the things is that um, when we think about uh, residence times, uh, they are just the inverse of the dissociation rate constant. So we can change two things. We can either make the bound state more stable, or we can uh, make the transition states like uh, the transition state uh, higher in energy. 
So these are the two uh, main ideas we can work on. So um, there are a lot of strategies to make the bound state more stable, like, I don't know, hydrogen bonds or more hydrophobic interactions, etc. you name it, but then it changes from target to target. Uh, and then uh, I have never seen uh, anyone working on transition states, and this would be very nice, but I, I can imagine this would be maybe more challenging because it's kind of challenging to characterize a transition state, right? Because the bound state, it's already available there from the crystal structure, but then transition state, you have to do simulations, uh, make tests to check if that is the, really the transition state or not. And what else? And then uh, there is also, uh, I didn't comment too much on this, but there are also motions in the in the protein itself. So there are some cases for kinases, I think for ligand, uh, for type 2 inhibitors of kinases, sometimes it's harder to take them out of the binding site uh, because you require a large conformation of changes to make room for the ligand to pass. So when it's harder to take the inhibitor out, so it also benefits. Uh, the residence time, meaning that it will be longer. And I think uh, the room is still open for a lot of simulations to come up with insights on how to optimize, uh, how to come up with strategies to optimize residence times. I think uh, this research is just in the beginning and there is a lot of room to not only to develop, but also to apply methods to get mechanistic insights for different proteins. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> okay. So now we have a lot of questions in the chat box. And the first one is, um, I'm interested in how to calculate k of value. So this question is a little bit general. How to calculate k of value? Well, uh, from the experimental perspective, there are methods like surface plasma resonance and what else? I just have surface plasma resonance in my mind right now. Um, and then from the computational perspective, uh, as long as you have uh, somehow how to represent the ligand protein bound complex, then you, there are a number of methods that you can apply. You can uh, check KB box to see the different methods. And then it depends on the computational resources you have also, of course, uh, tau Renji, uh, as I told you before, and also the targeted molecular dynamics uh, don't have... Uh, don't require a lot of computational time, so they are good, but they also, they give you relative residence times. Uh, at Tau Renji gives you relative residence times, which is kind of a disadvantage, let's say, but it's good to analyze a group of ligands and you can go for more uh, computationally demanding methods like weighted ensemble or uh, metadynamics, but then you need to define a progress coordinate. It, it depends on how much effort you want to put. But I, I, I particularly like Tau Renji because it's very simple, so. You just need to decide the force and everything else is fine. Okay, yeah, thank you so much. <laughs> the next question is, uh, did you compare Liga MD with Tau MD to calculate residence time? Uh, never, I never compared uh, Liga MD with uh, Tau MD to calculate residence time. I think the literature would benefit for this uh, major comparison of different methods for the same model systems, it would be nice. Um, yeah. But from my perspective, I, I'm familiar with the ligand paper and something uh, that I think is kind of a disadvantage there is that they get uh, less binding or unbinding events compared to Tau Renji, for instance. So Tau Renji, uh, the work I presented to you, uh, we made that estimates with like hundreds of unbinding events. And ligand, I think it gives you tens or, yeah, or maybe less than tens of binding and unbinding events. But then an advantage of Ligandji on the other hand is that it gives you both K on or, and K off rates, both binding and unbinding, something that Tau Renji doesn't do. Oh, nice. <laughs> yeah, thanks. I also think it's interesting to use the same uh, model system to, to do a benchmark for all the <laughs> methods. Okay, and the next question is, um, do longer residence time lead to toxicity? Ah, that's such a great question. So yeah, there are two things to a longer residence time. Sometimes people want a long residence time for a longer physiological effect, but I, I, I it's not in my head right now, but there's actually an example of a drug where people wanted to modify it to have actually a shorter residence time to reduce the toxicity because if the drug was there for a very long time, 
it would be toxic for the body. So yeah, this could also happen. So some, it's usually the case that some, that we want a longer residence residence time, but sometimes it's good to have instead shorter residence times to not have toxic events. That's a very good point. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, the next one is, is there any standard procedure or parameters for equilibration before running the simulation? Can the default values like simulation parameters worked in all types of target for unbinding analysis? Oh, okay, so for the equilibration, you can do your standard equilibration like everyone else do, like first uh, heat the system and then equilibrate the pressure and then run a few uh, nanoseconds of simulation just to uh, have the system well solvated in water and a good equilibrated system, and that's it. That is no... Uh, there's no special procedure required here before applying tau as, as long as you do equilibrate temperature and pressure and yeah. Okay, thanks. And the next one is can molecular dynamics based alchemical free energy calculations be used in determination of kinetics of ligand binding? Well, I think it's tricky. So in principle, in principle, you can, uh, for instance, uh, determine free energy surfaces for the ligand protein uh, binding and unbinding process and from this uh, calculate kinetic rates but in practice i uh, i'm not a big fan of this procedure because the challenge here is that you have to determine what is the transition state or the transition state ensemble to say ah this is the energy barrier and then we apply transition state theory to obtain the kinetic rates and the problem with uh, determining the transition state here is that uh, Take T4 lysozyme, for instance, there are like 10 different pathways for ligand dissociation. And it, it seems to me unfeasible to estimate uh, dissociation barriers for each one of them to then compute kinetic rates and then combine these kinetic rates into this one single kinetic rate. So, uh, uh, so yeah, just to summarize my whole answer, like in principle, we can estimate free energy surfaces and calculate kinetic rates from this. But in practice, I think it's a lot of computational trouble and I would avoid it. I wouldn't go down this path. Yeah, all right, thanks. Um, the next one is if I do have access to computational resource for simulations, is there any golden rule for ligand design to improve the binding kinetics? Let's see which kind of interaction tend to decrease KO without decreasing KO. Thank you. Ah, uh, yeah, I didn't talk about it, but then yeah, we are uh, always uh, we are always uh, bound to change uh, K on and K off simultaneously. So. Uh, if you if you change the energy of the transition state, uh, then you are uh, actually not only changing K off but also K on. So you make a dissociation harder, but you also make the entrance of the ligand harder, which is not good. And then uh, the other thing you can do is to optimize the bound state, and then this would be equivalent to uh, just looking at the dissociation constants, for instance which is basically just optimizing uh, the bound state, which is currently what is done, uh, what was done previously bef before people started looking at the kinetic rates. But then the other thing is that uh, one thing that is interesting uh, and something that it remains to be tested is that uh, if, the, if there is pathway symmetry, or in other words, if the pathways for ligand binding and ligand unbinding are really the same or not. Because if they are the same, then we have the same barriers for binding and unbinding. But if the barriers are not the same, then we have an opportunity to change K off without changing K on. But this is something that is completely lacking in the literature and it would be interesting to see uh, how it, if there's pathway symmetry. And I know there are some examples, at least for enzymes, where the the substrate binds uh, to a pathway and then the product uses another pathway, for instance. Hmm. But then for inhibitors, nobody knows. And this would be something fun to test if you want to work on this. Hmm. <laughs> All right, thank you. And um, there's also a comment to thank Dr. Arian for useful information about the specific MD simulation method. And uh, there's another question. Um, 
can people use TauRMD to predict the residence time for proteins with a, with a shallow pocket? With a shallow pocket. In principle, TauRMD works with whatever protein ligand uh, system you have. That's it. Okay, yeah, all right. So now we don't have any more questions and I have a last one. So uh, you mentioned that with the model system lysozyme, um, the pocket is really nice because it's not uh, solvent accessible. Um, so I think the question is not a very clever question. So if uh, you have a protein which uh, have a lot of solvent accessible amino acids in the pocket, and um, when you do simulation, what's the solvent uh, bring to the simulation? Like uh, what factor or what, what kind of um, rules should be considered when, or why it's complicated when you have a solvent accessible pocket? Ah, nice, nice question. Yeah. So I think if we think, for instance, uh, for this, somebody asked, what was the name? Oh my God, let me review the questions again. Somebody asked about uh, these alchemical free energy methods. So I think uh, overall, if you want to uh, estimate thermodynamics or kinetics, it's easier to not have to deal with the water because one of the things, uh, one of the problems is uh, when we have a water uh, in the binding pocket is that, uh, is this water important? Uh, important or not we have to decide this so sometimes we do a simulation and then the water is there in the binding site and it can leave the binding site and then the question is did it leave the binding site because i did a bad equilibration or did it, did it leave the binding site because it's really not a stable water there i don't know maybe uh, the water uh, is bridging uh, an in important interaction between the ligands and the protein and then uh, you have to consider this water when you are doing your alchemical free energy calculation for instance and then it just adds to the trouble and then if you want to do approximations for instance use implicit solvation then if you take this water off because your solvent is implicit then you are again making some very drastic approximations because the water seems to be important there so uh, my point is that when we have an explicit water we we really have to be careful first to decide if this water is important or not and then follow it in the rest of the simulation to be sure it is it is there and it's behaving the way it should behave okay yeah thank you so much <laughs> okay i think we don't have uh, questions anymore and um so then I think we can uh, close this session. And uh, thank you so much once again for your insights about the protein ligand binding kinetics. And um, thank you for accepting my invitation and being here today. And also thank you all for joining us today. And I hope to see you again next week. Until then, stay safe. Ah, yeah. And once again, if you want to apply for a PhD position in a group of Arian, then just uh, drop her an email. Okay then uh, stay safe and have a nice day or evening. Bye-bye.